So let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. How are we doing on our memorizing for Philippians 1? Anybody through the whole chapter? No. Okay. Well, I, that's good because I'm not. <laughs> I am to verse, I have gotten to verse 20 now. I'm working on verse 20. But I'm not, uh, it's funny because, uh, you know, I come back to it each day and I, you know, I look at the, what do those letters mean after all? And uh, it's not quite as easy as it used to be. Even then it wasn't that easy. All right, so Philippians chapter 1. So we're going to be in the last four verses here. And we've had basically so far, chapter 1 has been introduction. So the, he, he starts with this prayer uh, that he prays for them. And then he talks to them about uh, his ministry and his imprisonment and how that's going. He's sort of giving them a little bit of news, a little update. And in that update, he gives you a bit of how he thinks about the ministry. Of course, that's all of that's instructive. We can learn things from that. But now he's going to turn directly to direct teaching in these verses. And so uh, what I've decided to do tonight, like I've had different ways of doing this. I've tried the Bible study method where I give you questions, let you answer. Uh, and then I've, I think I did uh, on some of the Sunday afternoon ones, I've been basically doing a, a sermon. Uh, tonight, I, it's, it's not exactly a sermon, but it's not exactly a Bible study. What I've tried to do is give you like a Bible commentary. So your notes there are a Bible commentary very brief on these verses as we go through them. So you see I've put the portion of the verse and then uh, I've made some comments here so that you can, there's certain things that we want to point out as we go through. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll, I'll talk about those things that I want to point out and then at the end of each verse or end of each section I'll uh, give you an opportunity for some feedback or comments uh, or questions as we go through. So let's read from verse 27 to verse 30 uh, to finish up the chapter. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you and that too from God. For to you it has been granted, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. All right, so that's our passage. Let's talk about the first verse. This is the call to worthy conduct. Verse 27, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So, I have a comment here from uh, Kenneth Wiest. He says, Con conduct yourselves, that word means, it speaks of one's manner of life seen as a duty to a body or group of which one is a member, and to the head of the group to whom he is responsible. I think the, uh, the King James says, let your conversation here be in a manner that is worthy, right? Now, the word conversation has changed its meaning drastically from the 1600s to the present day. Today, conversation means, you know, somebody's yakking at somebody else. That's a conversation, all right? And you have a, uh, well, they're yakking back and forth, I guess, is a conversation. But this word, and I gave you the Greek here. I don't do this to show up, but just, you, we get words. You'll recognize, I gave you the Greek form, of course, but then... I transliterate that, and you might be able to recognize, as we read it, the word is polituomai. Polituomai. So we get our word politics from this root. All right, so the thing, this is the thing. Philippi is a Roman colony. What that means is that the many wars that Rome would fight, part of the deal with their Romans, with the soldiers, was after you served, I forget, it's 20 years or 25 years, I think, maybe it's just 20, they would, the promise was they would get some land of their own, all right? So what would happen is they would conquer some place. Well, they did it in Italy, too. They just said, okay, they took whoever was there, moved them off, gave, okay, this land, we're giving it to the soldiers. 
well, they're running out of land in, Rome, in Italy to do it, so they did this in Philippi. Whoever was there before, they moved them out. There's a whole group of Roman soldiers that retired there. Philippi was a colony city of Rome. So everyone who was a, a, a citizen of Philippi was a citizen of Rome. This is a big deal in the Roman Empire. Not everybody who was in the Roman Empire was a citizen. So the idea of polituomai, it has to do with your duties as a citizen. So this word would resonate with the uh, Philippians. They understood that. I, as a citizen, I have a duty to other people in my city, to my polis. Polis is the word for city. And polituomai, that's my duty, my, my conduct within the polis. Okay, so Paul uses this term to, to uh, play on their experience, th their duty of loyalty to Rome, but here he's talking about their duty of loyalty to the local church, the brothers and sisters in the local church, and to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, let, so conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. You belong to Christ now, so this is how you're supposed to live. You have obligations to one another and to the Lord. And then he says, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you. So Paul ex is expressing his hope to come to them. He has said that in the previous verse. But regardless, whether he came or not, he wanted to hear about their worthy walk. So that's, that's what he's saying there. And then he says Here's that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So there are several words here that are quite interesting. In this expression of their heavenly citizenship, they're walking as citizens, number one, stand firm. Here's another interesting Greek word. Uh, it is pronounced steiko, steiko. We get the word stake, like a stake planted into the ground. So stand firm, like you're a, you know, one of those telephone poles that stood, you know, plunked into the ground there. And don't move. Okay, that, and he says, do this in the inner man, standing firm in one spirit. Notice the word spirit is not capitalized here. It could be, it could be in the spirit, the Holy Spirit, but here it's, in the context, it's probably the human spirit, all right? All right, so this is, this is your thinking, uh, your inner man, and then with one mind, this is a, a synonym, the mind part, this is, but it has more with the attitude and emotions, and he says, uh, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And this word, we get the word athlete from, striving together. So, in other words, uh, with one mind, you know, athleticize. That's not exactly how you'd say it. But anyway, but, but, but play as a team. So there's a big emphasis here on spiritual stability and, and Christian unity working together, taking a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, living as Christians, you owe it to Christ. Those are the things that are in this verse. So the object of their effort is the faith of the gospel. So not just, this isn't just orthodox doctrine. Of course, it includes that. Like in any church, what we want our people to believe is the orthodox doctrine of the Bible. In other words, ortho, ortho means straight. So it has to do with the straight teaching of the Bible. That's what orthodoxy is. So we, we do want that, but it's not just that that he's looking for here. I think here it is the idea that we as a body, we gather together, we believe a certain set of beliefs, we hold those in common, and we're going to, we've planted our feet there. We owe a duty to each other and to the Lord Jesus Christ to walk in a manner worthy uh, of that testimony. A, a, a manner that honors that testimony. All right, so that's verse 27. Any comments or questions from anything I've said or the things that you've seen in the verse you'd like to ask or that you'd like to add? Anybody have anything? And if not, I will move on, but I will give you a chance. All right, so I must have explained it perfectly. Now when it comes to quizzing, you will get this verse correct, right? That's the plan. All right, so... Verse 28, the caution against any stumbling, right? The caution against any stumbling. It says, in no way alarmed at your opponents. This is a very interesting word. It's the word that is used in the Greek language of frightened horses who shy away when, ups, when startled, upset. 
and they can upset their cart or their rider or whatever. As I was thinking about this one, there's actually, uh, I guess probably most of you never knew my dad. There's a few of you here who did. My dad always had a mustache. The reason he got it, he started that when he was, I think, about 17. And the reason he did, uh, he, was in, uh, he was in the main street of this little prairie town in Alberta. I'm not sure if it was his horse that was uh, there. They were standing beside this, this team of horses. And uh, this was, so that would be 17, so in the 30s, I guess, that would be, or the 40s early 40s, so there were still people using horses. Some car came by and backfired. And the horse startled, and one of them kicked and caught my dad right there in the face. And so, of course, that had to heal up. And uh, he, while he healed it up, he didn't shave that area. And he never did again <laughs> after that. He never did again. He always had a mustache. And uh, I'd never seen my dad without one. So. However, but that's the idea. Horses can get spooked by sudden noises, loud bangs, whatever. And so the word is alarmed here. It, 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 people can get spooked as well. And he says here, don't be alarmed by your opponents. So who are these opponents? Well, we're not probably, as we read the context of Philippians, it's probably not false teachers or Christians who are, who are uh, 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 false professors or or, or not walking right. It's actually probably unbelieving Jews or unbelieving Gentiles who are their opponents. Given the context of where they are, they live in a city that is given over to idolatry. Philippi certainly was. They're not that far from Thessalonica. Remember when Paul went to Thessalonica, he was only able to stay there for a short period of time. Got a church started, but the unbelieving Jews in Thessalonica stirred up great opposition to, uh, to Paul, and he had to leave. And so it's not that far away. So it's doubtless that there was opposition that continued in the region to the Apostle Paul, to his teaching. And so that he says, don't be alarmed by the, don't be, don't be shy, don't shy away. Don't be startled. You know, when he said, put your stake in, stand firm, verse, the previous verse. So don't be startled by your opponents. And then he says, this is a sign of destruction for them but of salvation for you, and that too from God. All right, so the opposition of the opponents is a sign of two things. Number one, of destruction in their opponents. Why do people who oppose the gospel oppose the gospel? Well, it shows that they are destined for destruction. They are children of the devil in that sense. I think that term is used elsewhere in the Bible. They do not like God. They do not want God to rule over them. They do not, they are feel guilty uh, by the, even the presence of Christians. They, you know, there's often people, if they know you're a Christian, they might alter your be, their behavior, but sometimes they build a resentment towards Christians because Christians try to stand for what's right, try to live in a right way, and so there's a, there's a growing opposition. So that is a sign of destruction in, their, in the opponents. Now, sometimes people who are like this will get saved. And praise the Lord if that happens. But as long as they manifest opposition to the gospel, it's a sign of destruction in them. But it's also a sign of salvation for the Philippians. Of salvation for you, he says. That is their destiny. In other words... The thing is, it, if you suffer opposition for the gospel, it says, don't be startled, don't shy away from the gospel, stand firm like you're supposed to, because God has, is demonstrating the genuineness of your faith by the very fact that people oppose you. And you know, and, and you will have this. One way or another, if you want to walk for God, there will be people who will oppose you, they'll mock you, they'll make fun of you. They will, uh, they will try, they might try to do you harm. One way or another, this happens in our world. So caution against any stumbling in verse 28. All right, so now we've had, first of all, verse one, call to worthy conduct. Now caution against any stumbling. Any comments or questions after the first two verses? Yes, James. Uh, just a comment on the end, at the top of 20, it says, in no way alarm by your opponents. 
Um, thank you for adding the context of the goings on in Philippi at the time. Right. I always took that term to just mean like generally, like right. because there's going to be people who oppose you in all walks of life. Right. But it makes much more sense when you put it like that as, to, as pertains to Paul. And what, right. And what was going on there. So all right. So in historically, as we look in the book of Acts, we do see that in that region, there was definite opposition. Now, not in Philippi. Well, there was some in Philippi. I mean, obviously, Paul was thrown in prison in Philippi. Okay, but there was some there. But but uh, often, when you read the book of Acts, a lot of the opposition gets focused on the apostles. You know, some of it is directed to the churches. But as the apostles then leave the scene, those Christians who remain faithful to the Lord, well, the apostles are not there. Maybe their friends thought, well, once these troublemakers leave, they, they'll go, come back to the old way. Well, they don't come back to the old way. They're walking with God. They're living a holy life. They're not going to the drunken parties like they used to do. They're not doing the things they used to do. And that's a rebuke to the person who is lost. And so the person who is lost has that opposition. Now, we can generalize it to our own context. And if you have tried to live for Christ for any length of time, you will come to a place where someone doesn't like the fact that you're a Christian. That you said, no, I, I've chosen, I'm living a different way now. I used to do that, I'm not doing it anymore. It's, you know, I'm not judging you, I'm just living a different way. But people, uh, they, the, our society, they are, we're built to be social creatures. And when somebody steps outside of the society and becomes a part, really, of a subset, a, 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 a different society, that bugs people who are on the majority. That really bothers them. So there can be some opposition. Now, thankfully, we live in a country that has an, is a nation of laws, that there is freedom of religion, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the opposition is not as intense, usually, here. But I've experienced opposition. I've run into people who hated me because of Christ. Now, we've had sometimes some pretty intense opposition, but usually it hasn't been too bad. Certainly not what is like what is described in the book of Acts. Uh, but what he's saying is, don't be startled. Don't, don't be startled. This is going to happen. It's just part of what goes with being a Christian. All right, so any other comments or observations? Okay, so let's look at the last two verses. And then this one I called, I was trying to make it all C's, so here it is. Conscience, conscious of normal opposition. And he's giving a reason here. So you see the word for. So often the word for is a reason for what he's just said. Okay, he said in verse, don't be alarmed. Then verse 29, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. All right, so... So here, believing refers to the gift of salvation through faith, but suffering for the faith, then, is a normal consequence of, the living, of a living faith. And that's what we've just been talking about. But he reiterates that here. He says, you have been, God is giving you, he's, it's like it's a gift. Salvation is a gift, but part of that gift is the fact that you get to also suffer opposition for his sake. Okay, you get to be marked by Christ. And as Christ was hated by the world, so we are hated by the world. So it's a normal consequence of living faith. One of the commentators said, suffering in itself is not a privilege, but it is a privilege to suffer in behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, like if you suffer because you're ordinary and hard to get along with, all right, that doesn't count. People, I'm suffering for Jesus. Well, you know, yeah, you're hard to get along with. Right? Yes, James. Why did you look at me when you said that? Why, I didn't look at you. I didn't look at you. Why did you think I was looking at you? <laughs> All right. Okay. So the thing is, actually, I do have better eye contact with those in the back than I do with those in the front. This is an advertisement for the front row seats. People think in the back they can hide from the preacher, but you're the ones I see. <laughs> anyway, so that's just part of it. That's a little extra, not in the notes. But here's the idea that, that like, it's, you know, we can suffer, sometimes we suffer because we've done something wrong, we've hurt somebody else's feelings, we've, you know, uh, you know, been, well, we wouldn't say we lied, but we didn't exactly say the truth the right way, right? 
It would probably be a lie, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, but we've done something, and it's offended somebody else, and we, and we might suffer for that. We're not talking about that kind of suffering. Here we're talking about suffering simply because you believe in the Lord Jesus. Okay, that's what this is talking about. And now, we don't set out to suffer, but if you walk worthy of Christ. Now, the admonition back in verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Okay, if you walk that way in your life, you will experience opposition. Okay, you people will... Uh, You'll be marked out. Uh, you'll, you'll be with that kid. Like when I was in school, I, there might have been one or two other Christians in my school, in my class. And I, I was weird. Now, unfortunately, I'm a person who likes being weird. So that was fine. Okay? But it's hard being the weird one. Because other people make jokes. They look down on you. You're not popular. Be nice to be popular once in a while. You know, that was one of the great blessings. When I went off to Christian University, there were a whole lot of weird people. We all got along mostly together, okay? And it was different, so it was quite unique and how why it made such an impact in my life. But we don't set out to suffer. The point is this, if we will walk worthy of Christ, we will suffer in some way. So notice verse 28, he, or 30, I mean, he's giving an example. He says, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me. So what conflict did they see in him? Well, Paul was thrown into jail in Philippi. Remember Paul and Silas. And they had cast the demon out of the girl. This is Acts, uh, let's see, 16, Acts 16. Okay, he cast the demon out of this girl. She was troubling them every day. And they finally said, all right, depart from her. And then she, this girl, by this evil spirit, was being, was being used to tell fortunes for her owners as a slave girl. So they brought a case against Paul, and they threw him into prison. And you know the story, how he was, they were, I think they were beaten as well and put into stocks in the prison. And Paul was a Roman citizen. They should not have done that. Okay? But they did it. Why? Because he was a Christian and he did something right. Okay, so the, you know the conflict which you saw in me. And then he says, and now here to be in me. Now what is he talking about there? Well, he's in prison in Rome. So you saw it, and you're hearing that it's going on right now. But what he's saying is this is normal. This is normal. And so the admonition, he says, don't, don't shy away just because there's trouble. Don't shy away. Don't, he says, look, you saw this in me. You hear it's in me right now. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is how we live. So, so we're not going to let these things pull us away. We're not going to let these things spook us. We're going to keep on living for the Lord. And so just to review, Philippians should accept suffering for Christ is normal should not allow suffering to shake them from their course, and should resolve to conduct themselves as heavenly citizens under a personal obligation, like a political obligation, to the Lord Jesus. All right, any last questions or comments before we close up? Anything that somebody would like to add? Okay, well, let's pray then. Our Father, we thank you for this look into these verses. I pray that they you would enlighten our understanding and and intensify our resolve to walk with you for your glory so that we can be uh, uh, servants that are approved by the master. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.